I'm in Germany today at the birthplace of the clamping head. Heimbuch started in 1951, the invention of the clamping head in 1977, with 25 year patent where no one else could make this product. This is where it was all created, started, launched, and growing. Now we get to talk about how this happened, why this happened. So let's talk about these clamping heads because I know I'm not the only one that looks at this and looks at this and calls them both collets. I know I'm not the only one, you guys do it too, but they're not the same. There's a significant difference between what's going on here. Would you mind explaining the difference and how this evolution was started in 1977 and why? Okay, so uh, Imbu was producing collets like this spring steel collets in the 70s. And uh, we always thought about how can we make change over quicker, more easy, but qu and also quicker. And uh, the idea was maybe we could make two parts of these. So we, we cut the collet in here somewhere, and then we have four parts, the basic body and the three segments, which will just fall off. So we uh, take the basic body and uh, <clears throat> then we had to find a solution to, to hold the three segments together, otherwise they would be just useless lying on the table. And that's where we started to use vulcanization. And uh, yeah, that's, that's the story, the whole story. So from the, from the collet, we cut off the clamping head, which is only that part. And uh, then we make two pieces out of this. And with a changing fixture, I can just connect them, leaving the basic body on the trough tube and have a quicker changeover. That's why we call this only the clamping head because it, it's an evolution of the collet. Yeah, I've seen this before, and when my first career, whether you guys know it, whether you guys know it or not, I talk about it from time to time. I was working in precious metals on turning centers, and we only had this, and it was slow. So to see this and the evolution and knowing how quick that change can be, that's important. This is the beginning of quick change systems, 1977, but it's not limited to just round bar, is it? You guys have multiple options to have multiple setups for that quick change depending on what's going on with the customer. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So there are many options for the clamping bore, like uh, with serration, without, with different types of serration, or smooth for finished surface, and also different shapes, hexagon, square, whatever. Uh, for example, this one here is uh, with a gear, module, module 2.5, um, to clamping a gear wheel. And um, the next evolution step was having the hexagon on the outside, which is better against vibration, better against or better resistance against contamination. And uh, for bar work or for milling, this is the next evolution step, like in hexagon from the outside. Well, honeybees make something very similar to that shape, and we know the strength and rigidity of a shape that, that design, right? So it's kind of cool that you've gone that route. Now I'm seeing something here, it looks like eyeballs. Is this something special as well? What, what's up with the, these, these eyeballs that's looking at me here? You mean the, um, we call them the cat's eyes? Yes, the cat's they, eyes. They make it easier for the changing fixture to slide into the, the changing holes to find it more smoothly. If there was, would be no, um, no chamfer, it would be tricky, more tricky. And it's also to, to be recognized with our customers. So for 25 years, there was a patent on this product. Heimbuch are the leaders, the inventors, the creators of what's going on with this clamping head, right? It's amazing to me. People are just drooling to get their hands on this product. And now it's evolved all over the world. And the Heimbuch, what I like about them also, is they're constantly evolutionizing their processes. It's a solution company, not just a product company. But we're gonna take you more onto a tour to show you what's going on behind the scenes here in Germany in the headquarters. So I hope you'll join me. Well, my friends, as you can see, we are now in the inventory section of the Heimbuch headquarters here in Germany with my friend Peter. Now we're talking over eight thousand different products and over 200,000 pieces of inventory. Yes, you heard that correctly, so I will say it again. 200,000 pieces of inventory that go around the world. But what's the significance and importance from the Heimbuch perspective? This is what Peter's here to share with us today. Peter, let's talk about your massive inventory and why you collect so much for your customers. Yeah. Yes, Tony, this is right now. You, you said it right. We have 200,000 different parts here. 8,000 different products stocked here. It's only a small part of our magazine. And uh, why do we do this? We are a family owned company and it's so important for us. This is our philosophy that if our customer needs a part that we are available, we can send it out the same day, next day arrival in Europe. And this is very important for us. This is the philosophy of Heimbuch, of our CEOs. When I think of a lot of companies out there that don't have the ability to house such inventory based on the cost that it might incur, 
having a family owned company and being able to support your customers in such a way seems really significant to me. It is, it is definitely, Tony. It's a lot of amount of money lying here, but we found out it's a secret to be successful. We delivered these chucks out to all the customers and this is a quick change system, very fast. But what is the help for the customer if there's a chuck there, quick change, and the, car, the glamming heads are not available? So we need to have everything here on stock. It's very important. And it's our philosophy. It works. This is only German stock here in Marbach, but all our subsidiaries worldwide have a huge stock. Some of our huge dealers, they stock these parts. This is something what makes us special. We want to be available for the customers. Well, Peter, we're standing in front of so much inventory. And standing in front of this inventory, I want to reiterate with the customers watching right now, or potential customers watching, eight over 8,000 different products, right? So that might seem like a large number, a confusing number. How do I know what works for me? But you guys have simplified it here at Heimbook to make sure that they're taken care of. How do you go about doing that? Oh, yes. I understand you, Tony. We make it for our customers very simple. The customers comes to us with a part and we do the proposal for them. We say, that's exactly what you need. Our intention is to make most of it out of standard, not out of specials. So we use also for very special solutions, standard parts out of the magazine. And we, the standard solutions are run about 60% and only 40% is, is the special. So the customer gives us the parts. The customers trust us, what we love. They say, that's the part. Please help me do the solution and we do this for them. And something that's fantastic about that custom solution is there is no minimum. If you have a one off where some people you have to buy 10, 20, 30 one off, they can do one off for you, which is incredible. Now let's talk about what's in your hand right now. They look like cat eyes to me. It's I've talked to some of your other colleagues and I think they are cat eyes. What's the significance? Yeah, my colleague before showed you uh, on the cat eyes on the clamming head. It's very easy to, to, to change. We helped our customers now to change over with the changing fixture inside. But also, it's like it's like from Apple, for example, the Apple, it's also our sign, the cat eyes. If you see the cat eyes inside of a clamming head, you, you understand it's the original one. So this is also something where, we, where people can say, hey, it's a Heimbuch clamming head inside my chuck. So when I see cat eyes, I think quality, precision, rigidity, Heimbuch. Excellent. You cannot say it better, Tony. So now let's look into the future of Heimbook and step into what they've been working on for you guys. Let me take a moment to introduce the future by talking a little bit about the past. The owner of Heimbook is 81 years old and he's always said, I'd rather fail by innovating than succeed by copying. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the future of what's been created. And although it's new to me and probably new to you, there are some massive companies that utilize this technology that was starting to be developed about a decade ago, except now we get to bring it to you live through MTD CNC. Clemens, let's talk about this red light, these products here, what is going on? It looks really cool. Okay, what you see here is a, is a two different work holding systems, a chuck for outside clamping and uh, the mandrel for inside clamping, and they have integrated sensors, which means they give information which the machine controller can use to work with it. For example here, when I clamp my workpiece, this is a simulator for the good workpiece, when I clamp, I give the feedback that I have currently uh, radial clamping force of 11 kilonewtons, uh, that my, my current diameter with 65 millimeter 0 0.00 is okay, and I have good contact to the end stop. Now, when I turn it around, the diameter is smaller to simulate a bad workpiece, shows same clamping force, uh, and trouble with the end stop, and the, the diameter is not correct. So this is the information provided by the chuck, and now the machine control can work with it, like a robot, can take the part out, place it somewhere else, get the next good part into the chuck, and it's in the inline, so no extra measuring station or something, uh, just information from the chuck. The mandrel can do more or less the same. Um, also, you see here uh, the workpiece here, and the inside is shining. So that's the good one. I clamp it. Time and diameter is okay because I, I teach it before, and uh, the end stop is also good, and uh, that's the other one. Usually it's dark, so it's no pre-machining here, which would be bad for the grinding machine. And when I put it on the mandrel, it says, oh, sorry, no correct diameter. Put it out of the line, there's something wrong. 
Uh, Clemens, that is all fascinating technology, but there's even more to this setup than you just described, isn't there? Yeah, we have three things, the uh, clamping force, but also the measuring diameter or the diameter which the chuck can measure. So by clamping, I automatically measure my workpiece diameter, which is directly available now. That part is too big. The other one uh, would be good. So I, uh, I don't need a second station for measuring, which takes a lot of money, takes space in my machine. Under operating conditions, the chuck can measure up to a precision of uh, one hundredth of a millimeter. I don't know an inch, sorry. And, uh, and also we have the, the electronic end stop, which makes, uh, makes an air sensing obsolete. I don't need pneumatic air for checking if my workpiece is in contact with the end stop. And uh, which one is it? Here. We have a little flaw here on that contact surface. And when I clamp it, I directly see here, ah, oh, there might be a, a chip somewhere here in that area. The other ones, they don't have any contact. And that's also so something the customer can work with. We have one system running, or we have several systems running, but one, in one system, the customer is measuring every workpiece. And every tenth workpiece, he is compensating his tool movement um, by the last three diameters he has measured. So he gets a very constant result in his production. Clemens, you mentioned briefly that there's no secondary operation or another way to measure it. Is that previously how this was done, or were we just guessing this whole time, hoping that we were, had the right clamping force, the right pressure, the right diameter, all of these things? How did it work prior to this? Because this it seems like a really incredible advancement to me to make things so much easier. And because Heimbook always focuses on precision, just increased precision to make sure we're setting up correctly. Yeah, there are more answers to that question. So first. As an operator, what can I do to influence my clamping force? I change the pressure on the machine. So the first um, thing I go to my machine, I look at the diagram and it says like, I don't know, 20 bar or PSI means uh, this certain uh, axial force. But what reaches my workpiece as an operator, normally I don't know. So I can, I can use a measuring gauge. We also have something like this in our program and, and then go to the check and measure. But then I need the gauge extra and it's not in line. So the machine is standing, it's stopping. I take out whatever I have currently for clamping. I put in the correct clamping diameter for my measuring gauge and I measure. It takes a lot of time. Maybe I don't want to do this. And with a sensor which is integrated in the check, I get the information directly during the normal process. And I would imagine, but I have to bring this question up for the audience as well. This is an automated system. If I have, say, bar feed, and this is repetitive over and over, and I'm yeah. walking away, whatever type of automation, it'll show up either good or bad. And if it's bad, it's going to pick, put a pause in the system. Yeah. Incredible. To me, this is incredible because a lot of it was guesswork prior to that. After that, it's multiple steps and operations. In all aspects of what we're doing currently, we're reducing the overall operations and setup to reduce the overall failures as well, no matter what part of this industry of manufacturing we're working in. Clemens, thank you so much for sharing this technology. It's fascinating to me how advanced we are right now, and you guys being the leaders since 1951. Then we moved into 1977 development, 25 years of patent. Now we're growing this. What a fantastic quote by the owner as well. One last time, thank you, my friend. Heimberg, Germany, the headquarters, a family-owned company, and now we know the past, the present, the importance of inventory, and the future. Thank you all for watching MTDCNC, and we look forward to seeing you again real soon.